Greetings, everyone. I'm Paul Peppis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Welcome to another of our online uh, edition of OHC's regular work in progress talks. Work in progress talks are presentations given by faculty and grad students who are currently research fellows at the Oregon Humanities Center about their research projects. If you have questions at the end of the talk, please use the chat feature of Zoom. I'll moderate and ask the questions. We've also enabled the closed captioning function of Zoom. You can activate captions using the live transcript option. The talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing later today on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. I'm pleased now to introduce our speaker for today, Javier Velasco, a PhD candidate in Romance Languages at the University of Oregon and the 2020-2021 Oregon Humanities Center's dissertation fellow. Javier earned his master's degree in Spanish at the UVO in 2016, a Master of Arts in Latin American Studies at the University of Andina Simon Bolivar in Bolivia in 2014, and his Bachelor of Arts in the School of Law at the University of San Simon in Bolivia in 2006. He has been the recipient of numerous competitive scholarships and research grants while studying at the University of Oregon. His interests include Marxist theory, post-colonial studies, performance studies, aesthetics of art and politics. Based on his dissertation, Javier's work in progress talk today is titled Cars, Trains and Trolleys, Infrastructures of the Urban Space in the Andes, 1900 to 1952. Welcome Javier, it's great to have you here. Thank you, thank you Paul. Um, hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I, I, I just want to begin saying thanks to the Oregon Humanities Center uh, for the opportunity to be here and share with all of you uh, some aspects of my research. Um, the writing time that the OHC dissertation scholarship provides uh, is essential, uh, especially in these times uh, when the pandemic has also affected the normal process of academic research. Um, and sadly, I have to say that that has been my, my, my case. I, I had to conduct archival research during the summer of 2020, but due to the pandemic, that trip had to put on hold. Uh, so the term with no teaching duties uh, allowed me to make up some, some, some research time and give me time to write as well. So I was, I was telling Paul that Later, we can talk a little bit about how the experience of conducting archival research under pandemic conditions was. Um, I want to say an, an special thanks to Melissa, actually, because, uh, <laughs> uh, because she was always very patient and helpful in, in those many moments in which I had to reorganize my, my activities. So <laughs> thank you so much. Um, okay, so my, my research uh, explores uh, the connection between infrastructures of urban mobility and, and race formation in the Andean litera literature of La Paz, Bolivia, and Lima, Peru, during the first decades of the uh, 20th century. Uh, this was a time of accelerated modernization due to the, connect, the connection of the cities in Latin America to the European commercial circuit of the late uh, 19th century. In this light, I examine a diversity of cultural texts, which include uh, newspapers, photographs, institutional memories, etc., to explore how the history of urban mobility in the Andes met with sanitary and hygienic discourse of, of the time. Uh, I claim that this encounter has as much to tell us about a social anxiety coming from the dominant groups trying to control the social mobility of other groups as it tells us about the uh, spatial sensibility that affected the aesthetic register of the literature. Um, this is a work in progress, of course, so I will present uh, preliminary findings that I am just now organizing in my dissertation writing. Today I want to talk about Bolivia and how the history of the first tramway service connects with the fictional narrative of the time. I 
I, I prepare some image for you to, to see. Okay, well, I'm gonna share my, my screen. Okay. I, I'm, going, I'm going to start with a little bit of the historical context of my, my research. Uh, the Andean societies at large were organized around uh, three racially differentiated groups, the indigenous at the lower level, and then, then ascending the Cholo and the Criollo Mestizos, the Creole Mestizo would be the translation. The Cholo is an indigenous person who emigrated to the cities from the countryside. It is an urban identity, basically, the carrier of an indigenous and criollo cultural forms. On the other hand, the mestizo criollo, who saw himself as the carrier of a greater uh, racial purity, was at the top of the social hierarchy. Like much of the Latin American uh, region, Bolivia entered the 20th century under the ideological influence of the political and economic liberalism adopted by its elite since the late 19th century. In Bolivia in 1899, a civil war known as the Federal War uh, confronted the dominant groups in the South and North of the country. Uh, the war ended with the, uh, with the triumph of the North and the transfer of the capital uh, power from the city of Sucre to the, the political power from the city of Sucre to the city of La Paz. This event consolidated the power of the Criollo Mestizo elite, um, which from then on directed the course of na uh, the national formation until the 1950s. The new Criollo Mestizo elite based its cultural and political control on social dynamics that reproduce all colonial forms and racialized subjectivities as an argument for difference and social distinction. As a result of the civil war, um, the modernizing mentality of the new elite, La Paz began a process of expansion and growth that consolidated uh, as the most important city of the 20th century in, in Bolivia. The city's expansion come, came with the increase of the population in the urban area, which was the result of the immigration from the countryside to the city, and the new circuits of the social mobility resulting from commercial activity and the mining industry. The city acquired renovating energy and an expansive velocity following the principles of the time. There were new avenues and streets, public lighting, electric power, uh, new urban projects, the arrival of new technologies. Uh, as a result, La Paz was no longer a colonial village and, and became a, a city. Uh, the idea of change, movement, and rapid transformation was the spirit of the time and a form of social consciousness for the dominant group. And the result of that was that the city's uh, public transportation system changed in the same spirit, uh, in the same spirit. The new transport technologies bec became the symbol of, of modernity. This is a little bit of the political and social background of, of, of La Paz at the beginning of the 20th century. Now I'm gonna talk about my findings on the, on the subject of urban mobility with uh, special focus on the first urban trolley in, in La Paz. Over the 19th century, uh, the form of transportation of people and merchandise connecting the city with other urban and rural districts was by animal power or animal traction. In July uh, 1909, as part of the celebration of the centenary of the revolution against uh, Spanish uh, colonial rule, the trolley went through the streets of the city for the first time. Uh, the event was quite a party, uh, attended by personalities, politicians, foreign representatives, and special guests. 
over time, the trolley expanded to five routes uh, that connected the most distant sectors of the city and eventually had uh, 58 cars operating in busy circuits, all of them accessible to all social groups due, the, due to the low price of tickets. The trolley operated until 1950 when the service was interrupted. Its existence says about a modality of modern public transportation, but also about an era dominated by a caste mentality. That is indeed my interest in the trolley. As one of the various infrastructures of urbanization of public space, the trolley was the product of work and planification. And in this sense, I argue that the development of the trolley is strongly connected to the development of a hierarchical and caste-based society imagined by, uh, by the Criollo Mestizo elite. Social life is a construction process and the ideas of difference and hierarchy that govern everyday life are, fra are far from being expression of a nat natural state of things. And they are a product of a political order and a political rationality. In the case of La Paz at the beginning of the century, producing a transportation system required defining uh, and imagining a type of population through a process that articulated technical innovation and fantasies of progress. So a social dynamic was produced through practices of registration, use, and the limitation of urban space, which are to be seen in the extensive documentation left by the history of the trolley in the city. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about design plans, normatives, routes, photographs, and, and newspapers. All this documentation say about the social utility of the trolley, but also expose a type of political rationality producing a spatial sensibility about places of social participation. I want to mention a couple of examples. One of the first publications to show the implementation, design, and operation of the trolley was the Brill magazine published by the Brill Company, an institution founded in 1868 in Philadelphia, which was the largest producer of train cars and trolleys in the United, in the United States. The Brill Company was the producer also of the first trolley that arrived for the inauguration in La Paz in 1909. The Brill Magazine was a monthly publication that came out in 1907. Its purpose was to make public the new advance in technology and car design produced by the Brill uh, Company. The news about the cars built for Bolivia appeared in the edition of May 15, in 1909. In the issue that had on its cover page, as you can see, uh, the image of Baltimore and Calvert Street in, in, in Baltimore. It includes notes about new trains constructed uh, to operate in, in Chicago and the novelty of the convertible pay, pay as you enter cars for New York City. It is curious that almost a month before the trolleys debut in La Paz, the Brill magazine published uh, a note about the service when no local newspaper had published uh, such information. The magazine described the type of cars built at the request of the Bolivian rubber company, the transnational company uh, in charge of the trolley in, in La Paz. And while showing pictures of the interior and, and exterior of the cars, described the Bolivian environment as an ethnographic uh, document. Referring to the type of population that inhabited the, inhabited the city, the magazine said, and I quote, the population of La Paz is 60,000, of which 14,000 are white persons and the balance Indians and mixtures. The emphasis in the article on the supposedly white population in the city and the lesser importance given to the majority population in the city formed by indigenous and, and mixtures, as the publication calls the mestizo and choro population, is already a sign of the social uh, type 
identified with the new transportation technology. I don't have time to go into details, but the description and image in this issue are similar to the narratives of foreign travelers and explorers of the 19th and early 20th century. They were focused on the exotic picture of a country almost unknown to the world and closer to the space of nature. In that sense, the magazine showed the trolley almost as a civilizing artifact. I also found in my research the August 1925 issue of the Brill magazine, uh, which uh, has another reference to the trolleys in Bolivia. But what is striking about the, both the issues is the visual and written descriptions of the technical characteristics of, the, of, the, of these cars. The 1909 issue refers to the eight cars of similar dimension that were ordered for the inauguration of the service. It mentions that of these cars, three will be for first class service, three for second class service, and two cars that are a combination of first and second class. After this reference, the note uh, begins an extensive description of, um, uh, uh, of the cars designed um, the presentation qualities. The 1925 issue includes detailed technical descriptions and pictures of the interior of the cars. It refers to the mixed cars, first and second class, and the compartment that divides the space occupied by passengers according to the amount of, of money they, they pay for the ticket. We could, we could analyze how the excess of details somehow hides or neutralizes the social effect of the cars by means of a detailed description of design and presentation features. The existence of first and second class cars with different amenities according to the population that has access to them is the sign of a vision of progress in which technique is closely associated with a particular model of organization of social space. There is a vision of first and second class citizenship embedded in, in these descriptions. What I found interesting in, in these magazines is how the trolley was directly connected to an, an international economic circuit. And this is fundamental to understand that the trolley was part of a transnational phenomenon of circulation of cultural fantasies. This also uh, show, shows uh, that the trolley embedded a neo-colonial mentality by which uh, progress comes through the diffusion of industrial uh, products that go to the archaic uh, backward and pre-modern world. In that sense, my argument is that as it happens with all the urban infrastructures, the trolley was not a neutral presence and becomes a social uh, dynamic related to the use and participation in public. The photographic archive of the period is useful to see this. The photographs I found uh, as the ones as you see now in, in your screens are unique records of the first years of the trolley in the city. Both are representations of, of the tramway as an element of urban modernity at the service of the city's dominant groups. Even the titles of the photographs, uh, Dama Subiendo al Tranvía, Mean, means a lady boarding the, the tramway, or um, elegante pasajero, elegant or elegantly dressed passenger, show that the new urban transportation technologies, at least during their initial years, function as an added sign of status, elegance, and, and, and modernity in the vision that the, 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 of the criollo mestizo elite. When we analyze the photographic record of this time, it is interesting how we see the elite, uh, the Cholos and the indigenous uh, depicted, each with different markers of this distinction. In the photographs depicting the dominant groups, the elite almost always use the street, the public domain as if it were the natural setting of belonging. It is the street where they legitimize themselves, whether in public events or in daily walks where they display uh, their elegance. 
the connotative objects are umbrellas, elegant dresses, uh, hats, and of course, the trolley. Uh, they show confidence in the exercise of their functions as directors of the national modernity. During my time exploring archives in La Paz, I found uh, that the development of the new urban mobility infrastructures were strongly connected to the hygienic discourses that emerged in the 19th century. In general terms, sanitary and hygienic policies were the product of an European discourse of degeneration that showed up at the end of the century, uh, trying to explain the dark side of progress and the lack of optimism in the European societies at the end of the century. In Latin America, the discourse of degeneration gained uh, acceptance and was used mainly for a racialist explanation of the, reason, the reasons why it was so difficult for the new republics to become modern nations. For this, it made use of a type of medical and clinical discourse that defined the rhetorical component of the time and hygienic way of thinking by which the effective consolidation of national states depended on the physical and moral aptitudes of its members. In that sense, the debate on the body and illness uh, uh, was a, also a debate on the nation. The idea of the ill body, which stands for ill nation, was seen as, was seen as, uh, as the result of the problematic legacy racial mixing. In the Andes, the Cholo and the indigenous were considered uh, the generative uh, elements in the societies of, of the time. The relationship between poverty, uh, backwardness, and disease became stronger in the Andean societies of the late 19th and 20th centuries. Hygienic policies were put into practice not only because the sanitary conditions of the population had to be improved, but also in the belief that social disorders, political instability, and even the moral condition of the people could be, could be fixed. In Bolivia, I'm referring to the new political moment inaugurated after the federal war. The author and historian Fernando Diaz de Medina says that the new government had to act as a major surgeon, and I quote, to amputate the sick organ so that the paralyzed body would begin to function, end of quote. In this statement, we can see that the, the relationship between social disease and lack of movement or, or immobility, that is between the need for physical and moral health of the subject and this possibility of the country to begin to move according to the principles of the desired modernity. A relationship between hygiene and mobility arose at the beginning of the 20th century in the discourse of public institutions. Um, an example of, of, of that is the summary of the labors of the city hall in 1921. In this document, I found the, how the director of the city's hygiene institute gives a detailed account of the diseases and attack uh, that attacked the city during the year. For example, the spread of tuberculosis, which during that year presented alarming figure, was due to the lack of a public policy controlling the urban mobility of sick people. In the case of syphilis, this was due to the lack of control of street prostitution, which was considered the ideal means of spreading the, the disease. The report concludes under the mandates of uh, the hygienic discourse of the time. It says, it is time that we as progressive people uh, work for the country's future and this can only be achieved by forming a strong and healthy race. This is just one example of many that I found. The ideal of building a healthy race is always linked to a hygienic mandate that have to do with the control of urban mobility. And this control was directed towards sectors considered non-modern and responsible for national uh, backwardness, indigenous and, and choice. The chapter of my dissertation proposed that, uh, that uh, 
proposes that uh, hygienic and mobility discourses intersected in the urban trolley. The trolley, in fact, uh, has in its origins a public health mandate from the local government of La Paz in 1902. The city council of La Paz gave the Bolivian Rubber and General Enterprise, which was the, the company that put the tramway into operation, the concession of the waters of the Miluni, Las Aguas del Miluni, it's a water reservoir in the north of the city, for the construction of a dam that would fulfill two necessities, the construction of urban sewage and the production of electrical power to operate the city's first tramway service. In that sense, the idea of urban mobility is directly connected in its origin with a sanitary demand. The chapter explores how this connection between hygiene and urban mobility functions in the trolley to control the social mobility of groups perceived as ill or contagious, according to the definition of the chapter. Um, in the newspapers of these years, it's not difficult to find comments written by people who identify themselves with the dominant portion of society about the ugly aspect of the urban last landscape produced by the uncivilized practices of people of popular extraction. Among those practices, the lack of hygiene implying the risk of contagion that the proximity of these groups implies. A paradigmatic example of this happens in the, in the 1930s when the city hall of La Paz prohibited indigenous servants and cholas with grocery bags from entering the city's uh, trolleys. The ordinance argued that the grocery bags that the cholas and indigenous carried with them as part of their duties as cooks and maids ripped the, stocking, the stockings of the señoras, the ladies, and disturbed the trips of the caballeros, the gentlemen. I found that what pushed forward this ordinance was an editorial note in one of the most important newspapers uh, uh, of the time, criticizing the operation of the trolleys and demanding that the separation of entrance between first and second class passenger be complied. The argument was that by all using a single entrance, indigenous people and Chola women, uh, who enter with grocery bags, including vegetables and raw meat, which is not only disgusting for first class people, but is also a potential health risk. So I elaborate on how the discourse of urban mobility were strongly associated with hygienic mandates of, of, of those years. The dominant group embraced the new urban mobility as a symptom of modernity, but at the same time, use the new transportation technology to respond to a particular social anxiety, uh, the control of mobility of other groups in the city. Um, in that sense, in the next part of my research uh, is where I connect the documentation uh, found uh, with the literary production of, 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 of the time. This is because the connection is almost natural. And it has to do with the, the letrado, the, the lettered man, the intellectual, the, the writer. Uh, these letrado uh, people were mostly members of the dominant groups, and they combined their activities between politics, uh, teaching, even business, and of course, art. The newspapers of the time were a space for commentary on political and social issues, as well as a space where poetry or novels were published in, in, in weekly publications. So fictional narrative is inscribed in this circuit of social uh, commentary. And I want to show an example of this uh, in, a, in a novel I chose uh, for today. My interest is to explore how the anxiety of control of social spaces in the encounter of urban mobility and hygienic discourse tell tells us about the thematic and aesthetic register of the novel at the beginning of the century. In the Bolivian scenario, the narrative of the first decades of the 20th century is mainly a realist narrative, ranging from the novela de costumbres to the naturalist realism. 
The novel I want to talk about uh, briefly is a 1919 novel written by Jose Eduardo Guerra, uh, El Alto de las Animas. Uh, the title refers to a place outside the urban district in La Paz, where the, the novel ends when the protagonist decides to leave the city. In this novel, uh, Guerra presents the image of a city as a contradiction between two impulses or two, or two forces. On the one hand, the colonial nostalgia of the caste society represented by the protagonist and his family. And on the other, the reality of a city in transformation, both uh, aesthetically, a city that is integrating the changes of modernity and socially non-white groups, especially cholos and low mestizos that are gaining influence in politics and the economy and taking over the place and role of the traditional village. The novel is the story of uh, Andres Bermudez, a young fellow, a member of an old aristocratic family in decline since the father's death. Andres lives with his mother and his sister in the old family home, and his days are consumed in inaction, basically, in reading books and solitary walks, or walks with the few friends the young man has due to his solitary temperament. The novel first sentence creates an intimate uh, image. It begins with this sentence, invadía la sombra el aposento, which means uh, the shadow invaded the room. And then the narrator presents the image of Andres Bermudez, who reads uh, for the second time an old book in the facility of his room, sitting on an old piece of furniture that is a family inheritance, and remembering, remembering past experiences of his life. Andres remembers the day when his best friend, a young man of his class and, and social status, has to go abroad uh, uh, and, Andres, uh, and Andres sees him, uh, sees him off at the train station, feeling the emptiness left by, by his absence. That is the reason for his grief. That, and that tone of emptiness, absence, and loss is going to be a constant in Andres', uh, in Andres life. The narration closes this scene as follows. Eh, se apartó de la ventana y volvió al interior de la habitación. No quiso encender la luz, pues le gustaba estar envuelto en el ambiente de inmovilidad que encierra una estancia en la sombra. The translation more or less would be, he turned away from the window and went back inside the room. He did not want to turn out on the lights because he liked to feel protected in the atmosphere of immobility that creates a shadowing room. We then understand that in this initial fragment, the protected value is in mobility, the lack of movement, which Andres prefers as the, as the desire that the world around him does not change. Representation of this is the family chair, uh, the book that Andres has already read and in the past and now he reads again and the shadow of the room, which is a space of stillness, as if time does not uh, move forward. The, contra the contrast of this is the need for movement, flow and change, which is represented, represented uh, by the friend who goes abroad, as was the normal practice uh, for the Criollo groups of the time who, who travel, uh, aspiring contact with the European modernity. Uh, another symbol of, of, of this flow of movement is the, the, the train itself, of course, which is a symbol of velocity, movement, and, and transformation of the, of the new times. So with some romantic elements in the composition, the narrative announced the conflict that will frame the entire novel, a conflict between movement and immobility. The character's conflict is with the public and social space in transformation. So the narration tells how the streets have changed, the trolley replaces the, trolley replaces the protagonist's solitary walks through the city, uh, politics and economy uh, have become the, 
the, the territory of the lower mestizo sectors of Cholos, and they are no longer, as before, the immediate domain of, of, uh, of the social group to which Andres uh, belongs. The contact with this world of a new urban and social mobility, which is fundamentally the, the bourgeois world, is the reason why Andres will become ill. To pay a visit a, a person who lives in a distant part of the city, Andres and, and his friend are waiting for the trolley. Andres would prefer to take a carro de alquiler, a, a rented car, because he wants to avoid the trolley, as he says, I quote, por la cantidad de gente de toda clase que los ocupa, which means because of the number of people, because of the number of people of all kinds that goes in the trolley. Um, but the trolley appears at, the, at that exact moment and the, the narration says, Andrés subió el primero, le daba lo mismo, realizaba sus actos casi inconscientemente porque su pensamiento ocupado en otra cosa no le dejaba espacio para cuidarse de lo que le rodea. Uh, which is, Andrés got on first. It was all the same to him. He performed his, act, his acts almost unconsciously because he was thinking in something else, leaving him no room to take care of his surroundings. In this fragment, the trolley represents a fear of proximity something from which Andres has to take care of himself. There is a need for traveling to pay the visit to their, their friend, but that need implies a risk. And Andres seems to be the only one who perceives that risk. We can say that that risk is a fear of, of contagion. Uh, in one of the passage, when a friend invites Andres to have a drink in one of those places, uh, where the cholos and proletarian sectors uh, usually, usually go, the protagonist refers to the place as an antroinfecto, an infectious place. And strikingly, pages later, and with no reason, Andres falls uh, ill. The narration tells us, uh, tell us nothing about the reason for Andres' illness, only that he is uh, Victima de un decaimiento que su voluntad era incapaz de vencer. Victim of a decay that his will was unable to overcome. Here we can speculate a little bit. Among the more typical uh, illness of the time, such as, such as tuberculosis, uh, according to the psychiat psychiatric theories of the French uh, Levin, Neurosis or altered psychological states were of contagious nature and were attributed to the harmful influences of urban life. But urban life in this context has a racialized component. The disease comes from the contact, the contagion of the lower classes with whom Andres comes into contact through the new channels of mobility that have appeared. Um, is the proximity to the society of La Paz of those, of those years, characterized by the vulgarity and lack of refinement of, of its rising groups, bourgeois who have become rich through trade, mines, and political activity, and the vice, corruption, and lack of education of the popular classes living in the suburbs. In that sense, we see a connection uh, between the dynamics of urban mobility and disease. The initial impressions I get from this narrative is that uh, urban illness functions in the novel in a double sense. While it determines, determines a certain social pathology in the characterization of individuals and groups, cholos, low mestizos, and indigenous, who are uh, characterized as part of a social commentary uh, that the novel develops to expose the weakness and, and, uh, of a decadent and corrupt society. In the case of the protagonist, it, it functions as the process of creating his identity and his autonomy. Andres is un enfermo de la voluntad. I, I am not sure how to translate that, he's sick at will, or his, his will is, is sick. 
And while other people undergo commercial, uh, political, and romantic endeavors of all kinds in a city of cars, rights, and forms of transportation connecting people, Andres manifests no reaction to life other than simple contemplative individuality. A character that was influenced by the French decadentist novel, decadentist novel, sorry, Andres not only shows a fin de una era, the, the end of an era, uh, characterized by the withdrawal of a certain aristocratic identity that is replaced by other groups that are gaining power and ascendancy, as the few critics who have analyzed the novel have said. In the direct reference to Andres in mobility, uh, and in the metaphors that constantly construct the protagonist individual spaces as, as something that, unlike the world outside, does not change. The, the, the description of the family home, the rain in the city, which with the sound of, a, of eternal and repetitive drops that Andres hears from his room, the narrative builds an effect of distance between the protagonist and the world around him. Andres always feels strange in the activities he's involved in. So I propose that this distance is a sort of narrative uh, antidote and hygienic resource in the novel to contain apart the presence of other social groups in differentiated spaces. And the only mechanism by which the novel operates a narrative control of social mobility from the personal and subjective experience of the protagonist. And probably I should stop there. Um, I'm sorry if I went too long in my, my using of time. I, I hope we still have some time for, for comments and questions. Thanks, Javier. We definitely have time. Thanks for that really, really, really interesting uh, presentation. I would welcome our audience members to share their questions for Javier in the chat, and I will share them with him. Um, I, I can start. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, we, we met, you mentioned this at the beginning. Can you say a little bit about the challenges that you face doing the kind of archival work that you've clearly been trying to do and doing for the project during this, this time of contagion in our moment? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, it, 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 it's related to the social and political moment Bolivia is going through uh, right now. Uh, Bolivia is a kind of uh, unique set of circumstances. Uh, the, the Bolivian response to the pandemic has been one of the weakest in, in the region. And I could say that uh, at this point, you don't know how bad the situation is because uh, there are no official numbers. The problem is that uh, the Bolivian economy is, uh, I mean, 75% of the economy relies on the informal sector, which means that you have entire cities as the city of El Alto, which is uh, 25 minutes from La Paz, where people need to go out every day to provide for, for, for their family. So the government, as in many other places, uh, had to decide between protecting the economy or protecting the, the population. It's a difficult choice. And they choose uh, to protect uh, the economy, which could be a logical decision. Um, but the problem is that to avoid uh, the political cost of that decision, uh, they also decided to never make official numbers public or uh, manipulate those numbers. And uh, last, last time I checked, uh, two days ago, the hospitals in La Paz were, were full and, 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 and their lack of personal and, and vaccines. And, and the, the government says that they, they, are, they, they are providing 40,000 vaccines per, per day. But when, 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 you, when you hear from the, the, the local authorities, the health authorities and the press and political opposition, and even if you talk with, with friends and family, uh, you, you can see that that is absolutely not true. Uh, uh, as, as, as I mentioned before, a uh, case in point is my wife's family. They, they got the vaccine to 
two, two weeks ago, but they they also were told that the next shot will be in, in, in August. So uh, it's not only the pandemic. So we, we should remember that since 2019, Bolivia had been struggling with one of the most critical moments in, in, in the political history of, of, of the country. On October of 2019, Bolivians went to, to vote to elect a president and a vice president. And the social crisis erupted when, when the population uh, uh, found that an electoral fraud was organized by the now former president Evo Morales and his political party. So to make a, a long story short, uh, there is a complicated combination of, of circumstances that, that are happening right uh, so when I went there to, to, to conduct the research I needed uh, to do, uh, I saw that the, the, the country is working. Uh, I mean, the commercial activities were not interrupted. In fact, one of the, the promises of the new government was, was not, not to stop the, the economy. But the public institutions are, are, are not back yet to normality and the, the academic institutions, especially. My, many of them are, 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 are closed and, uh, or they are working in limited uh, hours of the week. So doing archival research uh, under these conditions uh, was fun. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I, I got uh, COVID when I started to visit uh, government buildings. buildings the beginning of the year. Uh, so to the access to some uh, pieces of documentation or are, are restricted or they are not uh, personal to help you with, with, the, with your findings. And uh, for the newspaper exploration, uh, for example, I even had to travel to a different city from, from La Paz to, to, to Cochabamba because uh, the major um, archive in La Paz uh, is, is the, the, the public uh, university that, that was 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 closed. So uh, it was a <laughs> it was a complicated uh, experience, but at the end everything uh, everything everything worked. So uh, we have a question from Pedro Garcia Caro, and it's a very interesting question. He reminds us. Uh, that um, 100,000 people died in Bolivia during the Spanish flu epidemic in, uh, in 1918 and 1919. And he's wondering, uh, do you think perhaps the novel was already responding to that other pandemic to a certain degree? So the anxiety that you've traced in the novel may be socially motivated, not just in racial and social ways, but also in health related ways. Yeah. It, it, um... I, I, I didn't think too much about it, to be honest, but um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, it, it, it reminds me uh, a, a book I, I read uh, recently. It's a book written by, what, what's the name? Um, uh, Beatriz Colomina. She, she is a scholar in Princeton, uh, and the title of the book is X-Ray Architecture. Arch Ar architecture, yeah. Uh, and in this book, uh, what, what the author uh, says, uh, she, she analyzes a, a little bit how the, how the, the sanitary discourse of the transitional moment going from the 19 century to the 20th century affected uh, the aesthetic and the style of the of architecture in, in Europe. So one, one, one of the, the, the major sanitary problems in, in, in those years were, was uh, tuberculosis. And, and the belief was that to treat the disease were necessary a combination of some some, some factors like air, 
a lot of exposition to, to, to air and sun and to avoid the, 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 the closed spaces and the places where dust could, uh, uh, could uh, accumulate. So the belief was that uh, you could get ill uh, by the act of breathing and that the particles of the disease travel through, through, through the air. So suddenly, says uh, the author, that uh, new buildings began to somehow to accommodate those sanitary recommendations and to the new styles in construction. So buildings with big uh, windows were constructed, uh, uh, buildings with more windows than, than, than walls to allow fresh air and light to, to enter the room, but also the inner space of, of, the, of the, the buildings uh, with clean and plain surface, avoiding ornaments where dust could accumulate. So the argument of the book is, and the idea I, I, I want to express is that uh, uh, illness was at the foundation of, of uh, modernity and is pretty much affecting every aspect of, 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 the, of the social life since then. And it makes sense Right? because the sanitary discourse implies a reorganization of space and, and a relocation of the body as well. And it has not only aesthetic results, but also political uh, effects as well. So it is possible that, uh, that the author is, is also uh, thinking in, in what happened in, in, in colonial times and using the discourse of the illness but I don't, I don't think that he's using it in a sense by which he's trying to, to, uh, to recognize some responsibility of the Criollo Mestizo or, 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 or that uh, Spanish in, inheritance in that, in that process, but is, is, is thinking uh, in a way in which he projects the future of the modernity. And he is using this 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 discourse of, of illness as a way to 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 avoid the, the the dissolution of its own group, probably. So, yeah, I I I think that this idea of, of illness and disease is is, is shaping uh, many aspects of, of the, the social modernity, but it's also telling us a lot about the present. And future and, and, and past. And I'm sorry, I don't have a, 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 an answer for, for Pedro. I, 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 I have to think a little bit more about the, the connection with the, with the colonial times in this, in this regard. So uh, a lengthy question uh, from John Jeremio, and I will, uh, let me read it to you, and then um, it may take some time for you to percolate on it. So first of all, he thanks you for uh, this intriguing presentation. The presentation certainly makes the case for David Nemser's infrastructures of race. The photographs that you showed us uh, show how notions of purity and dirt informed by the growing knowledge of pathogenicity contributed to racial and class attitudes, especially towards the Cholos and indigenous. The fears of proximity and concentration of bodies contribute to the state of the animas of the social body, its soul, life, health, vigor, but also carries the significance of the souls in purgatory. Uh, John wanted to ask if Nemser's theorization about how infrastructures in the colonial period informs your theorization about Bolivia at the turn of the century and how the emerging modern infrastructures of La Paz together with the growing awareness of pathogenicity feeds the notions of race and class in Bolivia in the early 20th century. Do you think that there's a connection between the title and the double meaning of the word animus in the title of the novel? Wow, that, that, that's a complicated question. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's a very complex question. Yeah, um, it has many, many components, of, of course. Um, first, I, I, I would say that, yes, of course, one of, of the authors I, I, I use for development, my, my, my research was Dan Nemser. Uh, 
he introduces this idea of the infrastructures as, as to analyze the, the, the colonial period and to show how the idea of race was not something given, it's not something natural, it was, it, it, it was the, the, the product of uh, spatial relations. And um, yeah, I, 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 I found that, that, that part of uh, Nenser's uh, analysis very intriguing and very interesting. I, I, I wanted to follow a little bit that, that, that idea and I, I started uh, my exploration about uh, the infra, infrastructures. And uh, the idea of infrastructures and, and the, uh, John's uh, question uh, allows me to expand a little bit more about the idea of infrastructure. I think it's, it's very important um, in, in the context of my, my, my research. Um, the infrastructure is, is, is an analytical category. And it, it does not refer to the classic Marxist discussion inaugurated by, by Althusser, uh, but to a contemporary notion coming from the cultural anthropology. Um, it's basically a, a relational concept. And uh, it refers to any presence in the social space that allows the flow and movement of people, objects, and, and, and cultural forms. Um, in simple terms, the, the, the idea refers to objects that allow to other objects to move. But in doing so, they activate like cultural signifiers, ways of belonging, and so on. I, I think that probably that could be a connection with, with John's uh, question because um, pretty much everything around us could be infrastructural in those terms. So I decided to explore a little bit about the urban mobility in uh, the beginning of the 20th century in the Andean space and with a focus in, in the trolley for La Paz. But if we think about it, the, the trolley is, is connecting us, is creating a set of relations in, 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 within the, 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 the urban space of those years. But the disease also could be con, con, considered as infrastructural to understand the functioning of, of the social mentality in, in those years. Now it could be, and, and, and probably that could be a, a way to, Path to to and to to answer a little bit more uh, Pedro's uh, question as well, because as an infrastructure of, of so society, so sociality, the disease was like this permanent presence, like uh, shaping the way we reorganize the public space and 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 and, and think about the relationship with with with, with others. But uh, I have to still, uh, I have to keep uh, thinking about it, John. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great question. I'm going to ask you to later uh, write it down for me because I want to keep like exploring about, about that. So the next question is um, that your, your account implies, I mean, it's a fascinating account and it implies that Guerra's novel is not going to be the only uh, literary text of the time where these kinds of patterns are going to be replicated. I mean, his that novel is, um, is like a perfect illustration of your project, right? I mean, it, the 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 kind of dichotomy between immobility and movement. Are you finding that in other literary texts of the moment? Is this is this a particularly distinguished text in that regard, or is this symptomatic of broader trends in in um, uh, Bolivian literature at the time, of of in those in those years, yes. I mean, uh, I I I choose a group of, of authors and, and novels who are interested in expanding this idea, this change of the which the the, the, the modernity implies in the uh, for the social moment that they are living in. So pretty much during the first dec decades of the 20th century, uh, 
I'm talking about the 19, probably 1909, 1910 to the 1930s, the literature in, 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 in the Bolivian context is a constant like preoccupation of these this, this changes. I, I, I have to say that this is a very little studied uh, corpus of, of texts. Uh, there is, they are not like uh, canonical texts in, in, in Bolivian narrative. So there is no much about uh, what the other critics have said of, of this text. So I am like, part of my archival research also implies to find this, this literature. And I found that these similarities in all, in all of these, these, these authors, they are, they are worried about, they are talking about the, 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 the new transformations that, they are, that are happening in, in the society and, and, and the presence of the Cholos and indigenous, which is uh, for them is like a dangerous presence because they, they are like, they signify that, 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 that they, they, they are gaining like, like power in, in economy and politics and, and the, the elites are, are afraid to lose uh, the, their status and uh, dominance in, in this year. So a quick follow-up question, given that your part of your work is the recovery of these texts, texts that are not part of the Bolivian canon, uh, do you have any interest or intention to get these books uh, republished or uh, you know, do critical editions of them or translations of them? Yeah, absolutely. That would be, that, that is actually part of my, 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 my interest to, to save those books from oblivion, right? Um, and, uh, and I hope I, I, I would be able to, to do this, this work in the near future. It's, it's a kind of complicated to do it uh, right now because, <laughs> Uh, yeah, like the sanitary, political, and economic situation has affected pretty much everything. But yes, it's it's an interesting project that I hope I can I can I can I can do in the future. Yeah. So we have a question uh, time for about one more question, and this one has to do with the kind of variety of materials that you draw on in your dissertation research. So you showed us those copies of the Brill magazine and the photographs. You mentioned other kinds of archival materials. Can you say a little bit more about um, your methodology in relation in, in relating works that are texts text that are non-literary of the sort that you've given us a taste of to these uh, novels that you're interested in? Um, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I, I I I wanted to include a, a little uh, a brief ref reference of that in, 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 this, in this talk, but I was afraid to, to be in too, too long in my presentation. But um, yeah, uh, the, the, it, it has to be with, uh, the, my, my research is, is related to, to, to uh, what is, it has been called like urban cultural studies. Well, so it's, it's a novel contribution to existing existing uh, literature on, 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 the, on the subject of Andean studies. And it's, it's an attempt to begin a discussion of the opportunities that uh, urban studies offer to somehow combine or unite the humanities and the social uh, science. And um, this is because uh, in my research, the representative aspect of the literary text, the fictional construction of the world, goes uh, hand to hand with other uh, uh, no literary texts, as, as, as you mentioned, from administrative documents and maps and other kind of publications. So my, my interest is not only to read literature as representations of, of the world, it's, my interest was not to to find uh, how many uh, novels of these years were talking about the, the tramway and what they were saying about it. So uh, the, 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 the combination of this uh, administrative text and literature uh, 
uh, allows me to think in a different uh, perspective uh, about the, the material conditions of possibility for, for those representations of the world uh, uh, happen. Um, yeah, I don't know if, if that answers uh, the, the question, but it's a little bit about the, the intention, the methodolo methodological intention in my research. No, I think it's very helpful. So Javier, I wanna thank you so much for this fascinating uh, presentation. This project is just an incredibly interesting one. I'm sure that everyone would agree with me. It was really fascinating materials. Thanks so much for taking the time to share with us about your work. I want to thank everyone else for joining us for Javier Velasco's Work in Progress talk. For more information about the Oregon Humanities Center and our upcoming sponsored events, or if you'd like to contribute to supporting our research and public programs, go to ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.